In section 4.2, we extend our consideration of vector spaces by defining the null space, column space, row space for a matrix. And um, we'll also discuss linear transformations um, in regards to vector spaces or subspaces will, will be the, uh, the key takeaway of this. We'll be looking at um, each of these column spaces, null spaces, and then um, as, as those pertain to linear transformations, we'll see that all these spaces are, are actually subspaces of a vector space. So um, and we'll establish that throughout these notes and in this section. And that's a nice fact to have because now these spaces will have all the properties of a vector space. So um, let's get started with our first uh, space of interest here. And that's the null space. So if we recall the homogeneous equation, AX equals zero is the matrix equation. Um, this thing is got such importance that we, we actually give the set of solutions to this matrix uh, a name. We call it the null space. So we used to call it the set of solutions to the homogeneous problem. Um, now we call it the null space of the matrix A. So it's almost a shorthand for, um, for all of this. And it, notice that this does extend to an M by N matrix. It doesn't have to be a square matrix. Um, generally, we'll probably deal with square matrices um, specifically in a lot of cases, but we can investigate the null space of, an, of a rectangular matrix, a non-square matrix. We'll denote it null A, if we're writing it in notation, and it's the set of all solutions to this homogeneous equation. And set notation looks like this. The null space of A, or null of A, is equal to the set of all vectors X, such that X is a vector in Rn, in other words, the domain of A, and AX is equal to zero. So in other words, it's all the vectors in Rn such that AX equals zero. So let's have a look at a quick example of this, right? Uh, the matrix A given here is, it's already in uh, row echelon form. So I can pretty quickly extract a solution from it, right? For its homogeneous problem. Now, again, like this is just the matrix A. So really I would wanna think about there being a right side column of uh, zeros here. So this would be three variable columns or coefficient columns for X1, X2, and X3. And because this is just the matrix A, when I talk about its, its homogeneous equation, I think about putting it multiplied against an X and equal to the zero vector. So the augmented matrix would be where this highlighter line is it would have a column of zeros as well. But we can accomplish all that um, without explicitly writing it. We, we, there is a shorthand for that. If I look at this row, work my way up through back substitution, this is uh, X3 is the leading entry here, and it's equal to zero over here. So for the homogeneous problem, so X3 is zero. Um, and what else? Well, we see that X2 is free by this column. So X2 is free if this is A's row echelon form. And then x1, well, it's equal, equal to negative 2x3 if we solve for, for the very, you know, for x1 in this equation. Well, x3 is 0, so x1 must also be 0. So it turns out this will be our, uh, what our solution looks like. It's a three vector um, that has the form 0, x2, 0. But we can parameterize that as 0, 1, 0. And that's times t, and we'll let t be an element of r. So this is just the linear combination of vectors that solve this. And well, it's just one vector, so it's just one linear com one element in our linear combination. So it's just a scalar multiple t times this vector. Uh, note that we, we, we were writing solutions uh, in uh, parametric vector form in the past, and that was kind of a common way to write it. Now we're kind of moving over to writing this in terms of a span. So this set of vectors that is represented by um, x here with t varying over all the real numbers is really just the same as the span of the vector 0, 1, 0. We can generate all the same vectors from this t times this vector as we would in this span. That's, that's just by definition is the case. So the null space of A is actually to either one of these, here's set notation for it, and here's uh, spanning set notation for it. Um, it just depends on what the problem asks for, how you should express it, but they both get the job done. I think this is a little more succinct, so maybe that's preferable um, if you're just writing things down. 
So that's the null space of A. It's the span of a set of vectors. And remember that the span of a set of vectors is a subspace, right? Um, it has the zero vector. It's closed under vector addition. It's closed under scalar multiplication, and so on. We saw that back in section 4.1. So um, that being the case, we could probably actually find a, a shortcut proof for this theorem here. But um, let's let's read the theorem first. A is let A be an M by N matrix. Uh, the solution set of the homogeneous system of M linear equations in N unknowns, in other words, AX equals zero, is a subspace of RN. In other words, the null space of A is a subspace of RN. So remember to show that something's a subspace. We had a theorem in the previous section that said that all we had to do was show that, that this space, the null space of A, is closed under vector addition and it's closed under scalar multiplication. So the way to do that is to say, well, let's take two vectors, x and y, in the null space of A, in the space of interest that we want to show as a, a subspace. We should be able to add them together and show that x plus y is also in the null space of A. So notice that my next step is to do this. I'll talk about why I do this in just a moment. When we look at x plus y, so I'm writing, I've written down the sum that I'm interested in. I want to know whether or not this sum x plus y is in this set null space of A. Well, if x plus y is in the null space of A, well, then A of x plus y, this expression, better be equal to the zero vector in order for it to be in the null space of A, in order for it to be a solution to the homogeneous equation. So that's why I've written down A of x plus y. So remember that A matrix multiplication against the vector um, is distributive, has the distributive property here. So we can distribute it to each of these vectors. I have AX plus AY. Well, each of X and Y were arbitrary vectors in the null space of A. So they satisfy this AX equals zero equation and AY equals zero equation. So this is actually zero plus zero. And the zero vector plus the zero vector is just the zero vector, which means that A times the sum of X and Y is the zero vector, which means that X plus Y is in the null space of A. It's a solution to the homogeneous equation. This falls out from the linearity of A. And uh, something similar happens down here for scalar multiplication, right? We have C, some, uh, some real numbers, um, uh, or some element of the set of real numbers. X is assumed to be an arbitrary element in the null space of A. And then A times C times X, a scalar multiple C times X, uh, remember, we can factor this constant in, to be in front of this matrix multiplication. We go back to the properties of matrix multiplication. We'll see that we can factor constants wherever we like, and or at least you know in this fashion. And AX, well, since X is in the null space of A, AX is equal to the zero vector. So we have C times the zero vector. And we saw in, in 4.1 that that is the zero vector. That's one of the... Um, Either something I think it's something we proved about vector spaces, not one of the 10 um, conditions of the definition. So C times X, this vector is also in the null space of A. So since X and Y and C were all arbitrary elements, in other words, we wrote them down, but put no other conditions on them other than the fact that X and Y were in the null space of A and C was some real number, um, then this is true for any pair of um, vectors X and Y in the null space of A. And it's true for any vector x and null space of A and con scalar C and R. And uh, we've, we've shown that it's true for all uh, vectors and scalars in the null space of A and in the field of real numbers, respectively. So we've proved that null space of A is, in fact, a subspace of Rn. Now, we would have known that this was the case already because we could, one of the probably the fastest ways to do this is to to write down, we could probably do this in generality and show that uh, the null space of A is the span of the set of solutions to um, AX equals zero. And if we could write that set as a span, well, then we know that the span of a set is automatically a subspace of the, the, the space that the set of vectors lives in, Rn in this case would have been that. Um, that might be a little bit harder to write down abstractly, but that would have been another way to prove this. Nonetheless, we've got it with this. And this is great practice for the technique of showing something as a subspace. So 
it's not a wasted effort by any means. So the first example is uh, let S be the set of all vectors in R3 whose coordinates R, S, T satisfy the equation this and this other equation here. So two equations and three variables. Um, we're talking about vectors in R3. S is the set of all vectors in R3 that satisfy these two equations. They have coordinates R, S, T. We'll write that um, you know, eventually horizontally. Right as our as our unknowns, but I write down my system of equations. Right, um, the one thing that I do is when I write this equation, I want to be able to put this in a homogeneous form. Right, or if I can, then I've got an advantage. And since we're talking about homogeneous um, matrix equations, we should talk. We should put things in the form of homogeneous systems of linear equations if we can. Well, this absolutely can be put in that form. We do so right here. Remember that the right-hand side is zero for a homogeneous equation. And right-hand side zero, and there are no constants on the left-hand side. In other words, everything is one of the variables uh, with its coefficients. So this is a homogeneous system of equations. So now it connects back to what we're talking about up here, homogeneous problems, right? And so I now have R, S, and T in order for my coefficients in this system. So I write my augmented matrix. This time I happen to include my right-hand side of zero. I didn't in the previous example, I was being a little bit more shorthanded about it and that's fine to do. Um, in this case, I just did it for clarity. Um, now I put this into row echelon form. Uh, I'm not sure what, what did I do here? Did I flip some rows? Um, since I did this work ahead of time, it looks like, uh, we subtracted row one from row, or two times row two from row one, I believe. Yep, that looks like that's what we did. And then we flipped the row. So that happened kind of quick. Maybe we, maybe you think of it in the opposite order, move this row to the first row. And then after that, zero out this two. So you can do the details of this and see that you get an echelon form. Uh, similar to this, and to check what you end up with, make sure that we have uh, similar situations with one of these variables being free, right? We have uh, a leading one and R's column. We have a leading one in S's column. We don't have a leading entry in T's column. So we have a free variable. T is free in this case. Um, so we write that down. And then we realize that this equation, or this line gives us this equation. The second line gives us this equation. So we solve for each of our variables in these two lines, these two equations, in terms of t, because we know that that's the free variable. This is all going back to chapter one. And we end up with this expression. Everything is now in terms of t. If we had another free variable, everything would be in terms of all of our free variables. Another way to think about it. And so when we write this, we have R, S, T as our vector. So the null space of A is the span of a vector of this form, negative T, negative T, T. And I just jumped straight into saying, well, that's negative one, negative one, one. And it's just the span of it, right? Because the, the intermediate step that we don't have here would have been, it's the one that we had on the previous problem. It would have looked like this. I would have written it as, this is the vector, um, uh, negative one, negative one, one times t, where t is in r. t is a real number. Right? So that's the intermediate step that I don't really need to write because that is, after all, just the span. Right? Uh, but maybe it's nicer to see it. Maybe another thing you could do, um, in, in terms, this is just maybe for a nice workflow, is say, okay, my vectors are made up of things that look like this. Okay, well, then I know that I'll immediately factor a t out of here. And so this structure, right, this constant structure in the vector is really the important part because t being some real number, of course, that'll just uh, uh, that's, just be generated by the span. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, we have another comment down here following up on the span of a set of vectors and R3 is a vector space. Remember that. So we, are, we already know that S is a subspace. They ask us here in the problem to show that S is a subspace of R3. But since it's we've expressed our solution as a spanning or as the span of a set or linear span, I think might have been the term that we used in the previous section. 
um, we already know that a linear span is a subspace. So as soon as we express a set as a span, um, we automatically know it's a subspace. We could, if we wanted to, go back through and say and show that if we have any two vectors that are in this span, they're going to be some kind of linear combination. So maybe A times this vector plus B times that vector. And then we could apply our matrix A and show that um, that linear combination of those vectors is, is uh, also in the null space. In other words, that A times those vectors is equal to zero vector. So this should be sufficient for that. Um, and that's just really a repeat, but with explicit values for A now and uh, forms of our vectors for X and Y. Okay, find a spanning set for the null space of A. Uh, we essentially did that in the previous problem. We weren't asked to do that, but I took it that further step to go to the span just because I think it's the most convenient way to write these things. So we have the matrix uh, A is 1, 3, 0, negative 4, 7, negative 1. Um, this is a nice row to keep in place. We zero out the second row and we end up with what we have here. Uh, maybe I get a leading one just to make my um, equations a little nicer when I back substitute and come out of this. I realize that I have leading entries in columns one and two. So X1 and X2 are basic variables. However, X3 doesn't have a leading one. So it is free. So now I know that for both of my equations, remember I'm going to solve everything in terms of, or as a function of X3. When I do that, I arrive at this for the first line, this for the second row, and then x3 is free. I solve for x3. And let's see, x2 is pretty obvious. It's just uh, 1 over 19 x3. Uh, what happens here for x1? Okay, since so x2 is 1 over 19 x3, this is 3 over 19 x3. And we move it to the other side with a subtraction. We get negative 3 over 19 x3. So I'll let you do the back substitution here for a uh, with this step, but you should get the same vector I do. Here's that intermediate step I wrote in on the last problem. I've got my vector generally written down with a three free parameter x3. And uh, that ends up being, well, it's just the span of this vector, right? It's just uh, any scalar times this vector is just the span of that vector. What we haven't seen yet uh, is, is when we get maybe two free variables, if we have two free variables, we'll have two vectors, right? We'll have an x3 vector, or maybe an x1 vector, or an x2 vector, or something like that. And we have that other vector, then we put a comma and have that other vector in our span. And it'll look like a less trivial span, because it'll be all the linear combinations of these two vectors. c1 times the first vector plus c2 times the second vector for any real number c1 and c2. In this case, the span of a single vector is just multiples of that vector, just like this shows. But nonetheless, it's a spanning set, and uh, it's also a subspace. So the column space of an n by n matrix, think of this one as the range. So the null space was um, solutions to the trivial equation, or non-trivial solutions to, home, to the homogeneous equation, that's what I mean to say, ax equals 0. The column space is the range of the matrix A. Um, so when we look at the definition, this is formalized down here for an n by n matrix A. Again, it doesn't have to be square. Uh, column of A denoted as COLA, right? So we'll just say call A or columns of A. And the column space of A is the set of all linear combinations of the columns of A. Well, that's just A times a matrix X, right? Or another way of thinking about it, if A is split up into columns A1 to AN, well then columns, the column space of A is just the span of A1 to AN. So let me write one more set in here to make this the same. Um, we see that this is actually just equal to the set of all vectors Y such that AX equals Y for some X in, what's our uh, uh, RN? Our domain space is Rn for an m by n matrix. Remember, an m by n matrix multiplies against an n by one vector, and it gives you an m by one vector. So it multiplies against an n by one vector, and you get out an m by one vector as your output. So, but anyway, um, so the column space, interestingly enough, is uh, 
Yes, is that. Okay, so um, for the, for the, let's see, um, this theorem down below tells us that the column space of an M by N matrix A is a subspace of RM. So, yeah, that's more or less what I'm asserting here. Is that right? Y is a vector in RM, right? Um, and this is a set of vectors in RM. So, yes, the column space of A should make up a subspace of RM, or at least a subset of RM. And we'll see that it's actually a subspace down below. This should follow somewhat similar to the other proof. We're proving something as a subspace of something else. Well, probably first and foremost, we could immediately say, well, this is the span of a set of vectors. And we can use a previous result in 4.1 to say the span of a set of vectors is a subspace, and we're all done. Uh, more interestingly is to see the direct method of proof. And that's just to see how these proofs come about and to get a little bit more intuition um, underneath our belts about uh, the situation or the, all of this material. So let X and Y be in the column space of A and we'll let C be some real number, some scalar. Then X plus Y is equal to some linear combination of A1 to AN, right? If it's in the column space of A, it's some linear combination. In this case, I've used constants alpha one through alpha n. It's fine, okay. And then y I've written down to have representation um, as a linear combination of again, a one through a n because y is also in the column space of a. It's a linear combination of the columns of a as well. And I've used different constants, beta one through beta n. So now what we know is that we can add like terms so the coefficients of a1 add to alpha 1 plus beta 1 times a1. We do that all the way up through out, um, a n to get alpha n plus beta n times a n. And when we look back at each of these coefficients, well, they're all real numbers. So this is some linear combination of the columns of a. So we know that x plus y is a linear combination of the columns of a. Well, that means it's in the span of a. So that puts it in the column of, or the column space of a. We see it's closed under addition. And then for, as for multiplication, it's just a simple matter of giving x that same representation it had above, multiplying c or distributing c's scalar multiple against all the coefficients of a, and realizing all the coefficients of these columns are still just some real number. So this is just some linear combination of a1 through a n. And as a linear combination of a1 through a n, it means that this element or this um, expression is um, in the span of A, and if it's in the span of A, it's equal to, or it's in the column of A as well, or the column space of A as well. So yeah, the column space is also a subspace of RM. Now, um, I guess I shouldn't say also, the null space, remember, is a subspace of R in, whereas the column space is a subspace of RM. So RM for the column space, and over here, so that the audio translates well, are in for the null space. The null space is a subset or a subspace of the domain, the vectors we're acting on. And the column space is a subspace of the codomain, um, the, the vectors we're mapping to. Okay, so that's a, a thing to keep distinct, or at least distinct in our minds. So next example, we find a matrix A such that S is equal to the column space of A if the column space of A, I'm sorry, yeah, if the column space of A is this. Okay, so we're kind of going backwards in this problem. So rather than find the column space, which is fairly easy to do, we just write down all the columns of A as a span and voila, we've got it. So maybe a more interesting problem is to say, okay, well, now that I know the column space of A, how do I get the matrix back well, if I even can? It turns out you can, and this is how you do it. So we write down this output vector. Remember, this is like uh, um, like the B in an AX equals B scenario. And then I decompose by three parameters here. I have an A and a B. These are the three parameters in this case. And I write an A vector and a B vector. And then I factor the A out and I factor the B out. And that's exactly what we see on this side. There's a sum or as a linear combination of these two constant vectors. You know that you'll stop when you get to a point where you have that 
constant, just nothing but constants, no free parameters in the vector anymore. Um, if it turns out there's another free parameter sitting around like a, uh, actually you shouldn't have a B out here and then a times C in here, that would be a nonlinear equation. So that won't happen, but um, just make sure you get to a point where you have just constants in the vectors um, and you'll have basically reformed this matrix, right? This is, uh, how do I know that these are the columns of the matrix? Well, remember that the column space of A is the linear combination of the columns of A, right? So uh, there it is. That may be another way to see this would be, I could rewrite this as uh, three, one, zero, uh, one, negative one, two, or the two columns times um, a vector whose entries are A, B. Right? And then I'd recover the expression I have all the way back here. And then I would know what my matrix is for that um, image space. So, so the columns of A are essentially the, the range of A. It's all the things that A maps to. Those are all the linear combinations of the columns of A. So the theorem below tells us that the column space of an M by N matrix A is all of RM if and only if the equation AX equals B has a solution for each B and RM. So this is good. This is, uh, this is onto, right? So if the, the column space of A is all of RM, so in other words, anything in RM can be mapped to, well, that's the same thing as saying if and only if this has a solution for every B in RM, we can map to any B in RM that we'd like to by a, a correct choice of X. Um, so why is this true as a theorem? I guess I just kind of restated it um, in that comment there. But if we let B be an element of RM, um, then there exists a vector X and RN such that AX equals B. Well, if and only if such an X satisfies this expression, really this proof is just going by definition of things, right? This is the reason we get equivalence to this step or if and only if equivalence in this step is because AX equals B is defined exactly as this. A times X is the linear combination of A using the columns of, or using the entries of X as the weights for the columns of A, right? We're doing the linear combination of A with uh, the entries of X as weights. So that is where that comes from. It's just by the definition of that product. And that's true if and only if, so X satisfies this expression, if and only if, B is in the span of A, right? So in other words, um, you know, there, the first thing is true if there exists an X such that this is true. That's true if there exists an X such that this is true. And this is true if there exists such an X that B is, well, if there exists such an X, then B is in the span of A, right? So this is equivalent to that. And then we pop out to the very end. Well, being in the span of A is the same as being in the column of A, the column space of A. And what I probably really could have done is just skip this last uh, um, if and only if and just said, well, the span of A is the column space of A, right? So we could, we could skip one equivalence, but nonetheless, we arrive at the same place. So that one falls out more or less by definition, but it is an interesting result to have. Uh, this, is our, this is an onto condition, right? Um, um, if the column space of A is RM, is its whole codomain, then we know that A is an onto transformation. So um, next up, if, it in, if A is an N by N matrix, then each row of A has N elements in it and can be thought of as a vector in RN. So we can start to treat A um, as a set of row vectors as well as, you know, just as we treat it as a row, as a, as, a, as a collection of column vectors. So the set of all linear combinations of the row vectors is called the row space of A, and we denote it row of A. So row of A is a subspace of Rn, as opposed to the column space, which is a subspace of Rm. So there we are. Now determine the row space of the matrix. Um, this is it. It's maybe a touchy subject, uh, and I'm not exactly sure because I just haven't checked um, what our online homework asks us to do in terms of these answers. They might want you to give horizontal vectors, right? Um, one, three, one comma three comma zero in horizontal form. Um, you know, just keep an eye on that. I feel like that's being a little bit um, 
maybe pedantic's the word. I uh, I don't know. It, it's a little bit silly because I don't know. I think they're equivalent things to talk about. Um, as long as we're not talking about them in terms of matrices and, and products and things like that, I feel like these are more or less the same thing. But uh, just keep in mind that when you do answer things in our online, online homework, they might want the vectors in horizontal form um, versus this vertical form. It's standard convention to write vectors in this form. That's the only reason I, I opted to do that initially. So um, this is actually an easy problem though, if you get down to what we actually did, right? We just took each of these columns and said, okay, well, these columns make up the vectors <clears throat> that are in the span, the spanning set uh, for these two vectors. And uh, that's the row space of A, right? It's literally all linear combinations of um, those vectors, which is just the span of those vectors. Um, I guess so we had, a, oh, this is a, a initial vector that we had before, or the matrix we had before in another example. Um, I, I just did it in row echelon form, but it is interesting to, to consider that um, these matrices are row equivalent, so they'll have the same row space. And that's actually true for column space and null space too. Um, two matrices will have the same column space if they're row equivalent to each other. So that's an interesting thing, right? A, a, a set can be spanned by different um, different vectors, right? So if we have a, a set that's spanned by two vectors, it could be the same space or the same set or whatever, um, only the vectors being very different from each other, right? Um, well, and maybe not both of them, but um, two different spaces can be spanned, can be the same space, or sorry, two spaces can be the same space, but spanned by different vectors. We could write um, many different ways of spanning a set. So this is just an example of that. And that's thanks to row equivalence that both of these things are, this, are the row space of A. OK, so let's go through. And this will kind of help us with uh, our sizes and dimensions for things to make sure that uh, we're clear on column space versus null space. So we're given a matrix A, looks familiar, and a vector U and a vector V. And they ask us then, determine if U is in the null space of A or if it's in the column space of A. So, okay, um, is it in the column space of A? Is U in the column space of A? In other words, is this vector U highlighted here, a linear combination of these three vectors, the columns of A? No, not at all, right? There's no way to take these two by one vectors and combine them and get a three by one vector. So um, it's just not going to happen, right? We might say this, uh, U is in the domain of A, so U is not in the column space of A. Remember, the column space of A is a subset or a subspace of the codomain of A. You want to think about it in those terms. So no, not possible. However, that leaves it possible for it to be, remember, we're going to multiply this by, uh, so is it in the null space of A? Yeah, we, we can multiply A by this vector U, right? So first row times U, and then second row times U to get, um, well, we see what's happening down below, right? We get this vector right here. So to check whether or not it's in the null space of A, remember that means that A times this vector is going to be equal to zero, right? So this matrix times this vector needs to be zero, the zero vector. When we multiply it, we don't get the zero vector, right? We get this non-zero vector here. This should actually have a little hat on it, a vector hat, there we go. So that's not the zero vector, it's 10, 23, right? Those numbers, are, neither one of those is zero. So U is not in the null space of A. Even though it was, it could have been in the null space of A, uh, it turns out it's not, we checked it with multiplication. There's no way it could have been in the column space of A because it's not even in the same space as A, right? It's in R3, whereas the column space of A is a, is a subspace of R2. So part B, so same thing, determine if V is in the null space of A or if it's in the column space of A. Well, V is a two by one vector. We can't multiply A against V, right? We do this first row times V or dotted against V and we realize, well, we don't have enough entries. We can't multiply A 
two by three matrix against a two by one vector. The inner dimensions don't match. So that's not going to work at all. It can't be in the null space of A, right? It's not in the domain of A. We can't, it's not a vector that A can act on, right? So it's not in its domain, so it can't be in its null space. However, um, is it in the column space? So in other words, is there an X such that A times X is equal to V? Now, if we think about that, that's just our old linear, our matrix equation, AX equals B solve for X. So we make an augmented matrix where we take A and append, this is our, our V is our new B, right? From our AX equals B system, append that in the right-hand column. And now we just put this into row echelon forms, searching for a solution here. We don't actually need the solution itself, we just need to get to rho echelon and realize this is a consistent system, right? So, so sure, we pointed out x3 is a free variable. We could solve for x2, back substitute solve for x1, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter because when we get here, we realize we have a leading entry in every row. And not that that's even important, but we have a, um, we have a consistent system because we don't have a leading entry in our rightmost column. Let me keep it as succinct as possible. Sorry, I'm saying, I was trying to say too much initially. We don't have a leading entry in our rightmost column, which means we don't have an inconsistent system, which means we have a consistent one, which means there's a solution. And it means that yes, zero, two, zero, negative two has some solution. Um, there is some X such that A times X is equal to zero, negative two. We didn't need to find it because we know that it exists thanks to this fact. So we're done with our work here and we can just conclude that V is in the column space of A because our system as an augment with this in our augmented matrix, it uh, turns out to be consistent. So that's all we're looking for in that case. It's a nice, a nice bit of reasoning there. So the last thing we'll look at is just a quick take on linear transformations, right? Uh, we just recall a linear transformation is um, a transformation um, from a vector space V into a vector space W, All right? So we're generalizing quite a bit more, right? We're not talking about Rn and Rm anymore. And we're gonna talk about this kernel and range idea. And that's gonna link to what we were just talking about momentarily. But uh, and it, it's linear if it follows these properties. We've seen these properties before, we've been using them. Yes, those are the linearity properties. So if T obeys those properties, then T is a linear transformation between two vector spaces. Now, it's T being a transformation, we're extending this idea that T is a mapping from Rm into Rn, or R, sorry, Rn into Rm like we did before. And now we're saying any vector space because not every vector space is is a real space, right? Some vector spaces are the set of polynomials, um, interestingly enough. We'll see down at the bottom that we're gonna deal with uh, the set of differentiable and continuous functions as our vector space. So um, we have the kernel or null space of a linear transformation T is the set of all vectors U and V such that T of U is equal to zero. So, um, what does that look like? That looks like our, well, uh, literally looks like our null space for matrices. And that's what this says as well. So the kernel, the null space of a linear transformation is, uh, is the same as the null space for a matrix uh, transformation um, for all practical purposes. The range of T is the set of all vectors in W, the codomain, right, uh, of the form T of X, for some X and V. So in other words, all the vectors that we can map to, all the vectors that have an X um, that maps to them. So maybe a better way to say this line is all the vectors Y in W such that there exists X and V such that um, T of X equals y. That probably looks a little bit more intuitive. Um, in other words, if we pick a vector out and that's in the range of t, then we can find, and it's it, we give it the label y, then we can find something, uh, find an x in the, in the domain such that t of x is equal to y. In other words, we can map to that y. 
So if T can be represented as a matrix transformation, T of X equals AX for some matrix A, then the kernel and range of A are the null space and column space of A respectively. So these things are all sort of connected the whole time. Right? I think I even might've slipped and said that the column space of A was the range of A. Um, and that was an informal comment, but we see here that it's, it wasn't too far off. It's pretty much exactly correct. So the example tells us to let V be the space of all differentiable functions on the interval A to B. So we're going back to calculus here, we have a closed interval A to B, um, some real numbers. And we let W be the space of all continuous functions on the interval from A to B, okay? And then show that the differential operator, D from V to W, right? So D from the differentiable functions into the continuous functions is a linear transformation. This is a nice, interesting problem, right? So um, the first issue is to show that the differential operator is linear. Well, uh, this is kind of a punt right here. Um, we don't really have to show that. It's something we, that we know, right? If, if I want to show that, I'm going to have to dig down to the limit definition of a derivative, of a derivative right? and then show that these linearity properties happen. So remember that limits are linear. We can split the limit of f of x plus g of x is equal to the sum uh, limit of f of x plus limit of g of x. So the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits provided both limits exist. Well, if both functions are differentiable, right? so f, f of x and g of x are in v, right? if they're both differentiable functions, then, um, then that limit does exist for its the limit definition of the derivative. And then of course the limit law lets us do that. So I did at least talk through it some of it. I didn't want to write it all down. You can go back to a calculus book to see why the differential operator is linear. Um, also recall that we can factor out scalar multiples of functions when we take the derivative. That, that, that gets done essentially uh, in tacitly all the time, right? You do it all the time without thinking about it when you take a derivative. Um, you just hold the constant times you know, the rest of the function in place. And maybe another constant shows up times it, but that constant just stays there. Um, so both of these properties are true because of uh, the linearity that the differentiation operation inherits from uh, the linearity of limits. So anyway, that's a good argument for this thing being a, a linear transformation. So now the interesting thought is this, if since, Different, the differential operator, you know, taking the derivative, in other words, is, is a linear transformation from differentiable functions into the set of continuous functions. Well, um, there's a good question. What's the kernel of that linear transformation, right? So what's the kernel of the derivative operation? Well, the kernel of T, remember, it's the set of all functions and so I've used this notation here, C0. It's a bit advanced. I could have just said, or maybe should have just said W. That's the space of continuous functions. <clears throat> C with a superscript like that means the number of times a function is differentiable and its result is a continuous function. For continuous functions, they're not guaranteed to be differentiable. So their index is zero. C0 means it's just a continuous function. A C1 function is one that is who's differentiable and its derivative is continuous. A C2 function is one whose second derivative is continuous. Right? So anyway, that's what that index comes from. All we really need to know is that C0 is the set of continuous functions. And of course, that should be, oh, no, that shouldn't be our kernel. That should be our, uh, I should, I had the wrong one. This should be C1. Um, C1 is the set of functions whose first derivative is continuous, right? And I think as far as we know for differential function, differentiable functions as we would have defined them in calculus, they're going to have continuous derivatives. So, um, and if not, then the set is really isolating um, to, to such functions. So um, it's the set of all differentiable functions F, as this is telling us on the interval AB, that's not so much an important detail, but um, technically it should be there, such that the derivative is equal to zero. In other words, it's the set of functions for which when I apply this differential operator, and this should be a T, 
or D rather, it's not T, it's D. That's our operation, differential operation, differentiation operation. Um, the kernel, it, it's all, it's any function whose result is zero right here, right? Well, who's, which function has a derivative of zero? If we stop and really think about it, it's the set of all these functions and the, and the set of differentiable functions that are constant, right? That's, that's the way that a function has a zero derivative is that it's a zero function. So it turns out that the kernel of the differentiation operation is the set of all constant functions. So we could probably on the right-hand side of this, put an informal equal sign or out here and say, this is the set of all constant functions. We, you know, sit, giving this answer in words it would just look like that. This is uh, maybe I'll put quotes around it because it's, it's an informal answer to that, right? So the kernel of the differentiation operation is the set of all constant functions. In other words, uh, constant functions are those who, for which when we take, when we do the differentiation operation on them, we get a zero out. So it's a nice connection there to calculus. And now the other one is this, what is the range of this transformation, this differentiation operation? So now we're talking about functions in the image space g and the set of continuous functions, c0 functions on AB, such that there exists a differentiable function f, the one in c1, right, the set of all continuously differentiable functions, and d of f of x is equal to g of x. Okay, so this, uh, let's parse it out one more time. So this is the set of all functions g who can be obtained by taking the derivative of a differentiable function, All right? So that's, that's in set notation, describing what the range of D is very precisely, but it, you know, it, it should make sense if we read it out and say it in words, the probably the difficult part of the exercise is to write the set down, but uh, the range of the differentiation operation is the set of continuous functions um, for whom, um, when we take the derivative of a differentiable function, we can get that continuous function, right? We can map to that continuous function. So, well, which functions are those? And there's a probably, a, that's a really good question. And what I write here, and this looks to be a pretty affirmative answer, C0, these are the continuous functions on AB. So it's all the continuous functions on, on AB. Well, how do I know that I can get all of the continuous functions on the interval AB? If you think back to calculus, so in other words, how do I know that for all continuous functions, G like this, that I can find a function F who, whose derivative is equal to G of X? How do I know I can do that? Well, if you think back to what that really means, if you take any function that's continuous, we really go back to the fundamental theorem of calculus. You give me some function g of x in c, and this is what I'll do, right? You say, okay, g of x is in c0, a, b. And then I'll tell you this. Well, if I say f of x is, um, what's the probably the correct way to write this? Uh, I'll probably have to say we go from a to x, g of t, dt. Right, I know that all continuous functions have a Riemann integral. There's our Riemann integral right here. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, remember, I know that the derivative of this function right here, or in other words, the derivative of f is g of x, right? That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I know that I can obtain a differentiable a function Whose, deriv whose derivative maps back to any one of these continuous functions. So you give me a G that's continuous, I can find an F that is differentiable and whose derivative is G. And that's what we see down below in red. So it's an interesting connection back to, to Calc 1 um, in terms of linear transformations here and their uh, kernels and ranges. So that's it for section 4.2. We won't do a whole lot of calculus examples like this, but it is nice to see that there are broader applications to this. We're not just doing this solely for the sake of um, working on things in real spaces.
Um, these linear transformations are all over mathematics and they have really important roles in a lot of places. Now that said, we will do most of our work still on uh, matrices with real entries and we'll talk mostly about things in RN, but it is nice every now and then to see an application that's got a broader scope and uh, more relevance than the rest of mathematics.